Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. It's the Ukraine War news update, first part thereof for the 15th of July 2024, second attempt at trying to speak. Um, I was unfortunate in timings this weekend, I was due to be on Jake Bro's round table. I was really looking forward to that, but I was out uh, on Saturday evening and I'm uh, away next Saturday. Uh, and so will I need, be unable to be on his again. So it's a real shame. There's some great people who have been great to have spoken to, Anders Puck Nilsson and others. Uh, but I am going to be on Silicon Curtain talking to philosopher Vlad Vexler um, today. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, it's been a long time coming, I think, hooking up with Vlad. Um, it, yeah, so that, that I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, we will be speaking about the Trump assassination attempt and how... That pertains, I guess, to the Ukraine conflict and also just elements of, of politics and uh, philosophy concerning that topic. Anyway, um, let's go to the Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats supply. You can find them on the description to the video down below. We can see that 1,200 personnel losses about what we have seen. Pretty predictable number given the stats for the last, uh, I guess, month. Uh, tanks, eight tanks lost, which is uh, on point for a daily average. We've seen that up and down. Last few days have been um, around that mark. 15 armored personnel vehicles is a downtick from yesterday. Still around the average, though. And 62 artillery systems is an incredibly high number. That's over three times the daily average in that category. So a bit of up and down here. Two anti-aircraft warfare systems. Depends what they are. 85 Vehicles and fuel tanks is an incredibly high number, three pieces of special equipment. So broadly unsustainable losses. Uh, the Russians, I think, must be, well, <laughs> they must be suffering because I think 85 vehicles and fuel tanks probably suggest that there is quite an active front line, but they aren't using a tremendous amount of armoured personnel vehicles. We're going to see a, a video in a second that does confer, possibly confirm that or doesn't disconfirm it, that's for sure. Uh, so I, it, I, where you where you m might think ah oh, fifteen APVs is just uh, you know one or two below the daily average, therefore they're not really attacking as much. Uh, eight tanks is on the daily average. I just think there there probably aren't huge numbers of tanks available for the Russians compared to two years ago. And likewise with armored personnel vehicles, they're replacing those with things like um, golf buggies, quads, motorbikes, and, and that's why you're seeing very heavy losses in it over here. Uh, so we're going to see Andrew Perpetua's loss stats with the knowledge that this was from yesterday, almost a day ago. Uh, it's from yesterday evening. So the timings have been a little bit uh, different and don't quite coincide with mine. But nevertheless, this is the most recent one. And you can see that there are huge losses here for the Russians, about three to one loss ratio there. And the numbers were well, actually, we we'll, we'll go to Andrew says 89 uh, Russian losses, 32 Ukrainian losses. And as far as combat vehicles go, we've got um, four, five, uh, no, four, five, six, seven, uh, 13, 14, 17, 20. So that's 20 combat losses. Uh, for the Ukrainians, we have one two three four five six uh it looks like just six there so that is definitely what the ukrainians would want which is a, a over a three to one combat asset loss uh, and with all of the vehicles in in total that's about three to one anyway so this is a good day for the ukrainians there's no doubt about that in terms of the numbers mass let's go and see uh, uh, what the individual pieces tell us um, and if there's any particularly high value losses, we've got the usual surveillance and comms equipment listed up there. Um, five pieces of that, a recovery vehicle and a unmanned sea vehicle there taken out with a, with a FPV drone. So haven't seen footage of that. And then we have a couple of artillery pieces, a couple of tanks, some MRAPs, mine resistant ambush protection vehicles and uh, APC. So most of that is Western equipment, two M777s, the Humvee, the two Max Pros and a Kirpy, which is a, a Kirpy is the Turkish for Hedgehog. They, that is a an MRAP, mine resistant ambush protection vehicle. They got they did get a number of those from Turkey. Quite 
a long time ago now. I haven't seen them on the lost list for some time. They did have quite a few of those. I was under the impression. Um, anyway, uh, as I've suggested quite a few times recently, you will see more and more Western equipment on these lists as they are going to be the preferred vehicles to use. And it could be that they've chomped through their older equipment. A uh, few trucks, quite a bit of civilian um, quite a few civilian vehicles there. Uh, most of the uh, the combat assets have been destroyed, captured, or abandoned. Um, but there isn't a huge data set to um, to look at there. Then we go to the Russian equipment, electronic warfare, surveillance and comms, recovery vehicle as well. Uh, similar sort of stuff there. Then we have quite a lot of artillery here. Some D30s and D20s listed. Um, and that would suggest possibly that they are obviously using more D20s and D30s, which would then suggest that they are suffering in terms of some of their better um, artillery having been attrited throughout this war. And then when you look at numbers like today's 62 artillery systems being lost, then this makes a lot of sense of the data we're seeing in the lost lists. Um, the... They do have huge numbers of these in the stockpiles, like we've been talking about a lot recently. You think, how is this sustainable? And on the one hand, it's not sustainable. That's why you're seeing D20s and D30s. On the other hand, it's sort of sustainable because they can just continually uh, eat into these vast stockpiles of toad howitzers that they've collected over 70 years. But when you start seeing D30s, D20s, M46s, uh, being brought to the front, front line, you know that uh, prima facie, the, the initial understanding of the term, this is unsustainable because they cannot sustain the, the losses of their better artillery equipment, the self-propelled guns and the larger, uh, more modern howitzers um, to the point where the, you, you're seeing these on the, on the front line much more commonly. Tanks, we have a T-90M destroyed in there. It was previously listed as abandoned, though, and uh, a number of other, mainly T-80 BVM tanks. Um, so quite a few tanks lost, quite a number of infantry fighting vehicles. Um, most of the equipment in the combat assets is destroyed or abandoned, so that's good news for the Ukrainians. We've got BMP-1s, 2s and 3s, BTRs, um, large amount destroyed, and same for the APCs and the MRAPs, uh, having lost, what, four VPK Urals there. A number of trucks, uh, ATVs, and a lot of civilian vehicles there, cars, loafs, uh, motorcycles, flatbed trucks, all sorts of, of equipment there. So that is a bad day at the office for the Russians. That, that's definitely the case. No hugely high-value pieces of equipment like air defence um, pieces listed here. And we have seen air defence um, articles on the general staff figures for a number of days uh, in a row, yet nothing particularly has popped up. We did get a couple from Andrew Perpetua the other day, actually. Um, if we go to look at another source, this is uh, Nalso, uh, Nalcio, sorry, who has some pretty good open source uh, data. Procross region, so this is Avdivka area, basically. They're moving towards that city of Procrosk. Uh, to the west this is in that uh, region but i don't know how far it goes whether it's just the abdivka area whether you can go further up now towards Turetsk and um, new york and further down towards um, krasna harivka and places or whether it's just abdivka but anyway you can see here that um, visually confirmed losses in that area amounts to 1449 russian losses plus 42 from the last time they did it, and two, 282 Ukrainian losses, plus 9. So just the most recent additions uh, are about uh, 4 point something to 1 Russian to Ukrainian losses. In total, that is almost exactly 5 to 1 Russian to Ukrainian losses. So I know that I've been talking about intuitively, I, I say Ukraine want a 3 to 1 loss ratio. Some people have been questioning that. It is just intuitive, uh, but I think in order to prevail in this war, they need to be attriting the Russians at those kind of rates. Um, otherwise, the Ukrainians have precious little equipment and they can ill afford to lose it. However, some people were talking about, well, okay, but if the Western 
forces and allies can continually replacing can continually replace the Ukrainian losses and the Russian allies aren't willing to do that with regard to combat assets then actually you can start reassessing the losses and then if they have got to a point where they are unable to lose as many tanks and uh, MRAPs and IFVs then maybe these other losses of civilian vehicles like your golf buggies and uh, motorbikes etc should be added on to those figures that that I take my kind of intuitive three to one ratio from so yeah I, I understand that that is really rough rule of thumb that I'm using there's no particular science involved in how I got to the three to one it's just what some people have been saying and I I, I just think it's it's a useful benchmark to look at to see whether they've had a good couple of days, good day or not. Um, but but admittedly, you can play around with those figures. Uh, but a five to one combat asset loss ratio, Russian to Ukrainian in the Pokrovsk area, is definitely the sort of um, attrition that the Ukrainians would like to see right across the front lines and all the time. Um, Perun has done an, a, a typically excellent video that I could dip into or I could, I'd love to just show you the whole video and, and talk about it as, as we watch it together. But I'm just going to play you two parts of this. First part is talking about B, pretty much BMP-3s particularly. So these are the most recent infantry fighting vehicles. So if you remember, BMP stands for infantry fighting vehicle. Like it is the Russian um, translation of IFV, right? So the if you like the IFV-1 and the IFV-2 and the IFV-3, the BMP-1, 2 and 3 you are the very much oldest, middle of the road from the 80s onwards, and then BMP-3 is much more recent. And at the beginning of the war, there were more BMP-3s um, available for the Russians. Now they appear to have exhausted completely their stockpiles of BMP-3s and they're eating into BMP-2s and BMP-1s as we've discussed variously. Uh, so the summary here in looking at the both the stockpiles and the, well, understanding that there are zero stockpiles of BMP-3s, the idea is that they are, they are still losing the same proportion of BMP-3s as a proportion of all the IFVs that they're losing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And so given that there are no stockpiles, they must be broadly making BMP-3s at the rate they're losing them. In terms of armoured vehicles, Rusi gives an estimate for produced BMPs over the course of 2023, a total of 463 for the year as a whole. That figure's an interesting one to check against what we saw in the visually confirmed loss data. When Russia invaded in 2022, the roughly 600 BMP-3s of the Russian ground forces made up just over 20% of the estimated active BMP fleet. Like a lot of relatively high quality Russian armoured vehicles, they were then overrepresented in the early 2022 loss data, presumably because a lot of the better stuff and better units got sent in first. Since then, approximately 500 BMP-3s have made it onto the visually confirmed loss chart. Not all of them catastrophic losses, but also you don't expect all losses to be visually documented. If you make some very quick back-of-the-envelope assumptions, like Q1 and Q2 2024 production being roughly equal to average overall 2023 production, and then increase the visually confirmed loss count by about 25% to account for things that might not be documented, things that just wear out, non-combat losses, etc., which are just illustrative figures, I'm not making any claims about accuracy here, you'd end up with about 700 BMP-3s produced in 2023 and 2024 to date, up against about 750 losses. There's a lot of factors we're not integrating here, like the change in what the total size of the overall BMP fleet active over time might have been, but it is interesting to see those sort of figures come out when overall BMP-3 share of the visually confirmed losses has remained relatively constant over time, almost as if the rates of production and repair have generally been enough to keep up with the overall rate of losses, but not enough to start seriously compensating for losses in other systems, like BMP-1 and 2. I'll come back to this. So the idea is that, that yeah, okay, they're keeping level with BMP-3s. They might be losing a bit, like there are no stockpiles at all. So they might just be on a net loss of BMP-3s, but it keeps it fairly stable within the context of the greater loss list. But they're not making BMP-1s and they're not making BMP-2s. So they're, yes, they're, they're managing to replace the BMP-3s, um, one for one-ish, but not the, the other 
the other types of vehicle and that means that again it's unsustainable okay they can sustain it while they are chomping through their stockpiles but as jumpy and high mars and covert cabal covert cabal are showing those stockpiles are getting dangerously low in some uh variants and a problematic in other variants that even where they do have quite a few left the question is well in what state are they in how long does it take them to refurbish them it's going to take them longer the further this war goes on it'll take them longer and longer to refurbish what they do have left because they will be more fundamentally damaged or degraded and everything becomes more expensive and more inefficient uh, and it just becomes more and more difficult for russia to uh, replace their losses hence you get to the point where uh, you see something like this, which is videos showing uh, a number of Desert Cross 1005 3s. Sorry, these are golf buggies, and in this one particular area, it appears that you have five golf buggies blown up, and that also appears to be an attack. So they are using five golf buggies to attack in a place. They're all blown up. Is that what you'd expect if? if this was the best functioning second greatest uh, armed forces in the world no you'd expect five bmp3s to be used but they're not using five bmp3s why are they not using five five bmp3s you would if you could you aren't so you can't so they aren't able to use five bmp3s so we go back to well they've taken unsustainable losses and that's why we're seeing a change in in behavior uh, so I thought, you know, that was interesting to know. I'll just go on to the end of this This section. overall production question more in the future. But for the moment, the big picture assessment, which is in some ways easier than the more detailed one, is probably this. Russia has significantly scaled up production of various war materials since the invasion in 2022. That's true of long-range missiles, of artillery munitions, and of armoured vehicles. But even those scaled outputs of things like infantry fighting vehicles and artillery munitions are nowhere near enough to keep up with the apparent rate of loss. That theory generally matches, I'd suggest, our observation that Russian storages continue to be drawn down and the composition of Russian equipment at the front continues to change. Russia's defence industry has been able to take the edge off the rate of equipment consumption in Ukraine, but the Russian military has still been heavily reliant on stockpiled material and foreign sources in order to actually keep up with it. Even though, so that's your the headline uh, conclusion, which we kind of knew is that you know, from everything I've been talking about over the years, is that that Russia, yes, they are making stuff just not nearly as quickly as they need to, and they're chomping through their equipment and they are uh, getting to problematic levels such that they are having to change their behaviour of what they are using on the front lines uh, so it's good that you know most people appear to be agreeing in their assessment conclusions with each other in the open source intelligence community now i i tell you repeatedly in answer to trolls and pro-russian members of well not members of the community people who post stuff on the threads uh who question why i'm not including the ukrainian losses when i you know such as the uh, ukrainian general staff losses uh for the russians okay we talk about that because i think this is generally pretty um justifiable these are justifiable claims and we go through all the evidence to support that why don't you talk about the ukrainian losses well because no one reports the ukrainian losses the, the ukrainians are very tight on that uh, so they don't release their own figures for obvious reasons. And the Russians do release figures, but they are just wholly, wholly unreliable in a way that these aren't. Like These are, maybe there's a little bit of over, over egging, there's a bit of guesstimation with personnel that, that means that they're not as accurate as they could be. But they're generally in the right kind of area and give us an indication, certainly of trends, of what's been happening. Right, so even if I don't believe that 62 artillery systems will be lost, I can tell you that they're really the Ukrainians are really trying to take out artillery systems at, at the moment. The last few days have been particularly bad, worse than you know, X, Y, and Z. And you know, we get an understanding of what's going on in general terms and, and trends, as I mentioned. The the Russian figures are so completely bonkers the official MOD figures, that I completely discount them. And here's a great analysis as to why they are discounted and should continue to be discounted. Again, we have some estimates for, 
and then finally how losses may have shaped the fleet composition. For that, we have two potential alternative sources available to us, the visually confirmed loss databases and the Russian Ministry of Defence. Moscow would obviously never lie, so we'll start with the Russian figures. On screen there, you have the official Russian Ministry of Defence claims for destroyed Ukrainian military equipment as of July 2024. These include 626 fixed-wing aircraft, 277 helicopters, 540 air defence systems, 16,528 tanks and other armoured fighting vehicles, 1,369 MRLs, 11,556 field artillery guns and mortars, and 23,453 units of so-called special military equipment, which have, quote, been destroyed during the special military operation, end quote. So I guess we're not counting damaged in these figures either. So the, these are e even worse figures than you would expect, as in these are only destroyed, not damaged. Whereas you're going back to the Ukrainian general staff figures, the understanding is those are destroyed and damaged and some of those will end up being recycled back into, uh, into use. These uh, the higher benchmark, if you like, here for these figures in that they are just destroyed. There are a couple of problems with some of these figures, but the biggest one is what happens when you start comparing them to the amount of equipment that Ukraine actually started with or has received from various sources. For example, Ukraine's believed to have begun the war with just over 350 MRLs, received maybe 113 from various sources, plus of course those ad hoc vehicles that might have been cobbled together on occasion. Those vehicles like Humvees or pickup trucks with a couple of rocket tubes strapped on the back do exist, but they're a fairly small minority in the existing visually confirmed loss data. So leaving them aside for a moment, we get a situation where Ukraine started with 354 systems, gained 113, and then lost 1,370 to enemy action to say... So the Russians are claiming that they have destroyed three times as many MLRS systems, or MLRSs, uh, that the Ukrainians could possibly have. It's, uh, and they're still using these, right? So that they clearly, they clearly are some. Nothing of things like equipment wearing out or breaking down, which means the Ukrainian military is currently doing a fantastic job, apparently holding the Russian military back with its negative 900 MRLs. The situation with fixed-wing military aircraft is arguably even more illustrative because you can't exactly bash them together in your backyard. You start with them, restore them, or receive them from foreign sources, or you don't have them. Here, if you start with Ukraine's relatively meagre pre-invasion inventory, and then add not just the aircraft Ukraine is thought to have received, but all the aircraft that have been pledged as well, but not yet delivered, and here you'll find the Russian military has again massively overperformed by somehow managing to destroy all of those aircraft, including the ones that haven't been delivered yet, at least twice. At this point, I'll stop throwing the boot in because I think you probably get the point. I don't dismiss official Russian claims because they're biased or unreliable. I dismiss them because they're impossible. If we switch over to you... Just, uh, uh, well, you can keep going on here, but it is absolutely insane. The, like, the, the loss claims from the Russian MOD are, as he says, impossible. And that's why I dismiss them and don't use them. End of... Right, a uh, problem that there might have been some strikes in Odessa on an S4, um, uh, sorry, a Ukrainian um, air defence system. Uh, as war vehicle tracker here says, it's the second picture that scares me the most, gives me Russian S400 Crimea vibes. In other words, it could well be that um, a Ukrainian air defence system being taken out. In fact, I think a number of air defence uh, S300s have been taken out recently uh, by the Russians in Ukraine. And I, I think this is pretty worrying uh, for the Ukrainians. There could be some kind of systematic effort, as you'd expect there should be, uh, of the Russians in taking out some of these really high value um, air defence systems inside Ukraine. Um, so fingers crossed that's not the case, but then when you have a, a fire like that in a place where there might well have been an S300 or, or similar, then, you know, you, you think the worst. So definitely have been some high losses, uh, high value losses for the Ukrainians over the last three or four weeks with regard to the strikes on the air bases, 
air defense systems around them and then the subsequent strikes inside Kiev that was facilitated by the degradation of those air defenses and by air defense I mean the aircraft as well that would have taken on air defense roles um, and then elsewhere like Odessa and others that I think War Vehicle Tracker had, had another one over the last couple of days of uh, a Ukrainian air defense loss possibly as well so not good news there um, right Going on to personnel here, uh, just a another interesting, though, you know, it is anecdotal claim from a Russian here. At some point, says Samuel Bender, the military thought they could at least control the use of personal cell phones at the front two and a half years in. All kinds of information and OPSEC is still making it home from the front. This is a good point in general, nothing to do with the, ex the exact claims he's making, but the idea that the people are still able to... Um, break OPSEC and report on what's going on on the front line. So here, a Russian soldier from 138th Brigade who participated in the Battle for Five Chance informs the relatives of his fellow soldiers that he was not able to get everyone out alive. This is the same battle that Putin so frivolously, frivolously described as creating a sanitary zone. For him, a couple of thousand here, a couple of thousand there have no meaning. Meanwhile, warmongers will say that Russia must keep pressing and Ukraine must surrender. So let's go and see what your man here says. He says, um, my dear loved ones, I'm going to just make this a little bit bigger. I'll read it out to you because I know a lot of you listen to this rather than watch it. Those asking about their fighters, um, their husbands, fathers, sons. Uh, we made it out. And he's in tears, by the way, this guy. In a group of 30 people, uh, 138th Brigade, Storm Unit, not everyone made it out. I got out 30 out of 46 people, so that's not bad. So six, well, I say not bad, that's one third of those people didn't make it out and goodness knows how many of those are injured, but he got 30 out. Many brothers are dead or wounded, so that's the assumption that of the 30 of the 46, 30 got out, but many might be wounded. Uh, I am wounded myself, he says. Sorry, sorry to everyone, I didn't save. Um... Uh, so on and so forth so uh, not everyone made it out yet I'm getting more people out uh, yeah so to have a what appears to be some kind of commander of a unit talk about loss stats talk about things being terrible like you know pretty much crying on camera uh, is is not a good look for the units here and it kind of goes towards this idea that it's been pretty disastrous up in the Kharkiv area for the Russians. Um, now, another train has derailed. This is in the Voronezh region. Uh, that Definitely not a good look for the Russians here. And um, that might be sabotage, uh, or, or it might just be a maintenance issue there. But um, yeah, that's not going to help their logistics out. And then we go on to distant strikes. Not too much to report of last night. Well, it could have been a fairly significant night for the Ukrainians because actually 22 drones were apparently shot down by all of them, you know, by the Russians, of course, they say that. In the Bryansk region, 15 drones uh, were shot down with unknown consequences. In the Lepetsk region, one drone shot down, reportedly fell on an electrical substation in the Star Stanovlyansky district but authorities claim it did not affect its operation in occupied crimea six drones were down uh, with local monitors reporting impacts in the area of cape fearland and cape fearland is is pretty important because as no report says an s300 s400 missile division of the 12th anti-aircraft missile regiment was targeted overnight in cape fearland occupied crimea reports indicate eight explosions contradicting claims that all ukrainian drones were shut down a radar station um, was likely damaged and there was an explosion at an S-400 position. The military unit is located among summer home cooperatives, also causing drone debris to fall on the houses there. So it could be another high-value target there in terms of air defence uh, for, um, for Crimea. In fact, Perun's video talks about air defence losses and the drawing from... I, I, he refers to the same source that I did sometime back uh talking about drawing from was it 11 of 17 air defense sites around russia have had air defense taken away from there and pulled to the front lines and so some some of those places have literally zero air defenses left 
on them. Um, so again, you know, is that what you'd expect if you, Russia had enough air defences to keep cycling through them and, and to keep um, defending the skies right across its country? No. So they're clearly in trouble with regard to air defences as well. A Ukrainian drone attack early on uh, this morning targeted a coastal area south of Sevastopol um, in occupied Crimea, claimed the Russian installed head of the occupied city, so they are admitting something's happened there. Um, so, yeah, yeah, although the Russians are claiming to have shot down uh, everything. So, yeah, there you go. Uh, here we have a thread from Chris O'Wiki. Now we're moving to other bits and pieces. A Russian general has reportedly forbidden troops in the Kherson region from recovering the bodies of the dead with temperatures approaching 40 degrees Celsius. This is likely to worsen the already extreme conditions currently being endured by the Russians. The the Telegram channel that Chris O'Wiki often refers to, a Russian one, reported that the Colonel General Mikhail Toplinsky, and Toplinsky is, uh, I've not reported this, a lot of you have been asking what's going on with Toplinsky. There's, there are um, rumours that he's been badly injured, and actually this thread does talk to that in a second. And he's one of the, the top guys um, in, in the area, um, but anyway, he has issued an order in effect for the last two weeks forbidding the men of the 18th Army to collect and remove the bodies of fallen Russian soldiers. He is said to have given no clear reason. I've seen a couple of videos. I saw one yesterday of just alongside the road. They collected the bodies and wrapped them up in like plastic, almost like bin bag kind of plastic. And But they were just littered all down the side of the road. There's just so many dead bodies. Um yeah, there's a lot of videos showing that things aren't particularly going well in that respect. There's no comment on the what the losses are like for the Ukrainians, but certainly the Russians are losing uh, some serious personnel there. And then that, that feeds into our understanding of how accurate the Ukrainian general staff figures might be. Anyway, Tplinsky's behaviour is said to have changed markedly following a report, reported injury in a Ukrainian attack on his command post in June. The nature of his injury has not been disclosed, but a traumatic brain injury could explain this behavioural change. And that was in Henichesk with a, with a HIMARS strike. According to a source, quote, inadequacy in the general's behaviour towards his subordinates began to manifest itself between the last wound he received as a result of a strike on the command post of the Dnipro troop grouping at the end of June. So, yeah, no, I mean, not a crazy amount of detail there, but it, it could be that Toplinsky is ordering bizarre things to happen, like the non-recovery of Russian troops. Um, and, you know, in the, this kind of heat, of course, that, that can lead to obviously all the flies and stuff like that, but then diseases and the smell, uh, and that's really bad for the soldiers still operating in those areas. So it could also be that it's dangerous, expensive, and they don't want to pay the soldiers' families with compensation if they recover the bodies. They'd much rather say that those are, bodies are missing, those people are missing. Um, okay, so... Uh, Kiev Independent reports that the energy, energy situation in Ukraine should improve after July the 20th as the government works to decentralise energy production. Interesting, uh, Prime Minister Shmihal has said. Um, wildfires have spread around the southern city of Novorossiysk. I reported this the other day. They've been continuing and it's so sad um, from an environmental point of view to see the fires rip through anywhere like this. We've seen it in Serebiansky Forest in the Kherson region as well. Uh, anyway, this has been prompting evacuations and Mayor Andrei Kravchenko uh, to declare a state emergency on the 14th. Uh, so that, I wonder if that will affect any military activity around the port of Novorossiysk. Um, Ukrainians are reportedly being recruited talking about fires by Russians on the dark web to carry out arson attacks in Lviv, Kyiv, Dnipro, Odessa and other cities. Uh, for between $1,500 and $2,000 each, Ukrainian army vehicles are have already been reported burned in three cities. Now, this is what I warned about some weeks back. Uh, I've long thought this and I didn't want to talk about it actually, so I've thought this for over a year, is that fire is such an easy destructive weapon for any anyone in the world right if if i don't want to start suggesting things but you know if you're someone like isis and wanting to cause maximum destruction you go around trying to work out how to 
create a bomb and then you go through the dangerous process of making a bomb in your house that then may explode and then taking that bomb somewhere and then having to detonate it and often leading to like a suicide bombing or whatever. It's far easier to just go and burn stuff. It really is. And, um, and I think this is going to be a challenge for societies going forward. Like I think it, this is going to be a major weapon of this war. And we've seen that in Russia. The Ukrainians have known that and have used it well. Right, you've had relay boxes getting burnt. You've got more fires inside Russia than you could poke a hairy stick at. Now, the, the the idea of that is that this is cheap and easy and causes a lot of damage. Right, so if you are paying someone a couple of hundred dollars in Russia to go and do that, or a thousand dollars to go and burn X and Y down, then the return on investment is huge, and for you know for a very little outlay. And likewise, now you're starting to see Russia cotton on here and we are seeing sabotage events around Europe involving fire uh, we've seen the deal metal um, place burned down recently we've seen a number of fires in in different locations well now it appears that the Russians are utilizing the dark web to try and get uh, some Ukrainians possibly with Russian sentiments, maybe even not, maybe people who just need money uh, to go and do these sorts of things. Uh, Chris O'Wiki continues, Ukrainian publication Strana reports, quote, a Mitsubishi Pajero of the servicemen of the 80th separate assault brigade was set on fire in Lviv. Two bottles of kerosene were found at the scene. Two vehicles of the Ukrainian armed forces were burned in Odessa, namely a Sang Yong and a Nissan Navara. The fourth case was recorded in Rivna, and this an extra was burned there, which volunteers brought to the Ukrainian forces for transfer. An absolute shame. Think of all that that uh, fundraising to go up in flames. The independent Russian news outlet reported stories had had discovered. Uh, stories is the name of it, has discovered that on the 6th of June, adverts appeared on one of the largest Russian language dark web platforms, asking for people to set fire to military vehicles in Ukraine. According to important stories. Uh, quote, the ads are posted in the section for so-called athletes, physically strong people willing to beat up or maim others for a reward, as well as commit arson and other forms of property damage. Initially, the practice of hiring these people was widespread in the drug market to punish unscrupulous drug couriers, but later spread to other areas. Customers offer from $1,500 to $2,000 for selling fire to cars of Ukrainian security forces and employees of the territorial recruitment centers in Lviv, Kiev, Dnipro, Odessa, and other cities. The requests are posted in Russian. Their authors are recently registered users who have not been active in other sections of the site. They communicate with the performers via encrypted messengers or Telegram. One of the customers claims that he is acting only for reasons of pacifism. The same user closed the deal with the executor of the successful arson of a military vehicle on Wednesday afternoon when news reports appeared about the burning of Ukrainian armed forces vehicles. As important stories notes, the attacks come against the background of an apparently Europe-wide Russian campaign of sabotage and arson. It's very likely that they're part of the same campaign. I'd agree. This is something to worry about, not just within like the, the Ukraine-Russia war. I think this is just an easy form of... of hybrid warfare if you like that uh, any uh, n any nefarious entities could could get involved in so yeah watch out for this one arson is a huge uh, problem because it's relatively low risk with a fairly high um, reward if uh, depending on what your intentions are Anyway, uh, that's enough for me hopefully that was of use thank you very much for watching please like subscribe and share Speak soon and keep your eyes peeled for Silicon Curtain.